Apollo lens in space. Social networking makes us lonely. And shame on Hulu for thinking Jerry Seinfeld used a PC. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 367 for Thursday, June 25th, 2015. This show is sponsored by NatureBox. NatureBox ships tasty and guilt-free snacks right to your door with over 100 flavors to choose from, like mini Belgian waffles. You'll never get bored of snacking again. Try NatureBox at naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. Let's get to today's tech news. NASA and Microsoft announced Project Sidekick to send commercial technology into space. A pair of Microsoft's augmented reality goggles, HoloLens, are the first to go up. They're scheduled to launch on SpaceX's seventh commercial resupply mission to the International Space Station on June 28th. Joining us to talk about Project Sidekick is Matt Weinberger, tech reporter for Business Insider. Welcome, Matt. Hi, thanks for having me. So what's the plan for HoloLens in space so astronauts can play Minecraft when they get bored? I mean, that too, probably. But the, uh, the the big idea here is that the coolest part about HoloLens is that it literally lets you have holographic projections interact with the stuff you're already doing. So if you're in space, something breaks, you can project a hologram over it and it'll show you how to fix it. Given that you're in space and things going wrong is, is a real problem, this can solve a lot of issues for astronauts without the hours and hours and hours of training that they might otherwise need. So, like, anyone could be able to go up to space now? I mean, I'd like to think anybody could go into space anyway. But uh, no, this would, make, this would make it, they say less training. I don't think it'll ever get to no training because space is really scary. <laughs> you say that as if you've been there. I mean, I've read a lot of books. I, I <laughs> like I've been there. Yeah. So what kind of testing have they done on HoloLens to make sure it'll work up there in zero gravity? So they've done it. So so as we saw in the video you just showed, they they put it up into the, they call it the weightless wonder jet, which is basically how they train astronauts for low gravity situations in the first place. So, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to bring the HoloLens up there and have it break the first time you take it out of the box. So they've been taking them up, taking them down. Uh, just making sure that they can stand up to the pressures of being in scary, scary space. So it'll it'll reduce the training, and uh, if someone you know gets in trouble up there, they'll be able to you know be helped more easily through these devices. Yeah, uh, through through your garden variety Skype, they can just open a window, and someone at Mission Control can walk them through whatever. Uh, have you read The Martian? No, I actually haven't. I've well, heard good things. <laughs> I am listening to it right now. It is an excellent book. Um, and I, I keep thinking about this when I read this story because, you know, he gets stuck on Mars. No spoilers. Most people know that. Yep. But, um, yeah, he would have, he needed a HoloLens up there. Well, they, they even said in the press release um, that someone at NASA was saying that this could actually be a huge help on missions to Mars. Because if you load that up with the collected expertise, it means that there, there needs to be a lot less contact with the home base which will be really cool for manned missions elsewhere. So do we know what else they're sending up there and when? Um, so they're sending, they're, they're kind of vague on it. They say that there's going to have to be even more testing when they take it out of the box up there. Um, so they're not even going to start using it for real uh, before the end of the year, they say. So any, um, go ahead. But they're going to say, oh, they're going to send up more HoloLenses, they say. If this works out, I'm sure Microsoft is happy to send NASA as many hollow lenses as they need. So uh, do you think this was just a deal from Microsoft that Microsoft made? I mean, what there's lots of virtual reality. Why why didn't why aren't they sending Oculus or one of the other devices? Well, so the thing, the, the big difference between HoloLens and something like Oculus is that HoloLens is augmented reality, which means that when you put it on, you're still seeing the world in front of you. You, you can tell them I'm you know, I'm demonstrating here. Uh, you can see the world in front of you. It just overlays the projections on top of it, but it's still very much the real world. You put on an Oculus, and obviously there's use there, but you're totally immersed in virtual reality. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do with that, but it's less useful probably, I feel like, for doing something like fixing a broken airlock or something. So the HoloLens, they can play Minecraft and also fix the airlocks. They can play Minecraft on the International Space Station and build their build their castles or whatever on top of the airlock <laughs> or out in space. Excellent. It's the coolest thing. Well, you wrote another story this week about VC investor mm -hmm. Josh Elman of Greylock Partners. He recently said that social networks like Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter are making us feel more lonely. Now, we've heard this sort of argument before. Greylock, I mean, yeah. Elman isn't saying we should all get off our devices and go camping no. in the woods. What was his argument? 
His argument was just that you that there's room for a kind of app that brings us more into the moment together. Um, he cited stuff like Snapchat and Meerkat. He's on the board for Meerkat, so he's biased. But, uh, uh, he, you know, stuff that is about being in the moment together, stuff about live streaming or sharing things in front of you without worrying about it going on your permanent record, so to speak. Um, stuff that can really share. He Something he said, which I thought was interesting, was that, like, we can both be on our phones and it might be 3,000 miles away, but at the same time, we're on our phones together. So he wasn't necessarily talking about, uh, he was he was talking about things being archived. Like if, you know, if we're always imagining every picture we're taking is going to go up and stay there forever, we're not being our real selves. Is that what he's talking about? A little of that, but also the other thing which I thought was interesting that he said was that, and this is something which I think resonates with a lot of people, it's that you go on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn and it becomes kind of a land grab for followers, for more readers, for more more people to engage with, but you end up creating a lot of weak attachments and only a few strong attachments. Stuff like Snapcat and Snapcat, Snapchat and Meerkat, um, they really reward having a few dedicated followers that, you know, that emphasizes the relationships you have with people. It's an, inter so. it's an oh, interesting it's argument because, I mean, you know, it seems weird to call out Meerkat, which is something, you know, we're basically broadcasting our lives. It's, it's a one-way kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, it's about saying, I'm seeing this thing. This is, this is his argument at this point, but I know that I'm seeing this thing and I want to share it with people. Yeah. And I bet you it's know? sort of a community because, you know, it was oh, Periscope absolutely. that lets you send up the hearts and, you know. Oh, absolutely. And it's to him, but it's also at the same time, it's that, that, that's when, that's when you have the big uses of it. That's when celebrities do it. Uh, when, when I just do it, it's more of a, I want to share this with my friends kind of thing. And less of a less of a I'm going to be the next Katie Couric kind of thing. So that that's what his argument. I mean, do do you yeah. believe that? I mean, do you believe people want that more of that live internet? Is he talking about? I think that there's definitely room for it. I think that I'm not sure if any app we have today is really the one solution to this. I think Snapchat comes close in some ways because it really does reward you for having only a few strong connections. Um, but at the same time, I think we've all felt that. That, that fear of missing out or that FOMO from going on Facebook and seeing that you have 5,000 friends but not actually knowing any of them, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that that's a real problem that's going to be addressed or that there's going to be a lot of successful apps and companies that address that phenomenon. Uh, I'm not a Snapchat user, so you'll have to explain to me, how does Snapchat reward you for not for only having quality followers? Well, because it does this thing. Um, honestly, I haven't used Snapchat very much in the last few years, and or the last few months, I should say. And I'm sure I'll get a million angry tweets telling me I got this wrong. But it has a best friends feature um, that really rewards you for only having a few really good friends um, and just talking to them. For instance, my girlfriend is the only person I have on Snapchat right now. And we just use it for sending each other pictures. And that's literally our only use for it. Yeah, I mean... Um, that my daughter uses it. I have it, um, and she, you know, she only has like four or five followers too. I guess, yeah, it, it rewards you because it's sort of an in, in, it's intimate in that way. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it's really like, I saw this and I thought of you at, at its best. Right. And then there's also like the Snapchat stories, which are again more broadcasty, but at its best, it's I saw this and I thought of you. Well, I don't understand why um, email doesn't work that way or chatting or, you know, Facebook Messenger or, I mean, it seems like they all sort of work the same way. It's one-to-one -one conversations. That's kind of, that's for conversation, but there's also, there's not a whole room for context or for, you know, photos, photos are different, I think, pictures worth a thousand words or whatever. Um, there's also the ability to, to draw on the pictures. There's also, and also the, the fact that the pictures do vanish, give it kind of a sense of urgency. It makes it fun. Again, at its best, there's a lot of bad Snapchat out there. Well, I'm I'm wondering if people really prefer that to that kind of um, distance that Facebook or Twitter gives us. I mean, any, anyone who has an iPhone can FaceTime at any time, but uh, you don't see that as people's main mode of communication, I think, because we'd rather not. That's right. I think, but at the same time, people like having the option. And there's also plenty of people who do really enjoy FaceTime. It's handy for some people. Ask any ask any couple in a long distance relationship, and they'd probably rank FaceTime as one of the best inventions of the last of the last five years. You know, right? So, it's go ahead. The options. It's the context. Yeah.
Uh, you, Elman is also an investor in Nextdoor. So you talk about that. That's a social network for neighbors that is ideally bringing people close together. Uh, do you use Nextdoor? I don't. I fear and loathe my neighbors and people in general. <laughs> well, that's how I felt. I mean, I've just started using it. Um, it's excellent for finding lost pets and getting yep. rid of your stuff. Uh, but the people I've talked to uh, sort of agree with me so far that uh, we don't necessarily want to know that much about our actual no. physical neighbors. It's yes and no. I think that, again, this is still something which I think we as we as a culture are still kind of figuring out. It's a step towards whoa, Facebook is too broad. Whoa, Twitter is too broad. How do I bring it more into something that touches my everyday life? I don't know if people really want to be in their business in that way, but I have to imagine that, like you say, for lost pets and finding stuff, it's a start, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting world we live in because, yeah. I mean, that used to be our only community, our actual neighbors. And now, you know, we have the option to you just have this community at large and it, time will tell, I guess, if that's yeah. what we want or not. And, but I think that there's also just this phenomenon of burnout with people overextending themselves socially. And there's going to be this movement back towards smaller, more personal communities like Nextdoor, even if it doesn't look exactly like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Matt. Matt Weinberger is tech reporter at Business Insider. On Twitter, he is at Gameoid. That's G-A-M-O-I-D. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks, Matt. Take care. You too. Bye. Coming up, Amazon Echo Unleashed and Uber Pop gets the French Revolution treatment. But first, this episode is brought to you by NatureBox. Right now at NatureBox, you can get a trial of their favorite snacks and just pay $2 for shipping. You know you're going to snack, and when you do, you want it to be worth it. Something that's tasty and satisfying but doesn't make you feel guilty afterwards. You don't need that guilt. What you need are snacks from NatureBox. Choose from over 100 healthy and crave-worthy options to be delivered right to your door. All their snacks are made with zero artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners, zero grams trans fat, and no high fructose corn syrup. And best of all, they taste really, really good. So good. And so much better for you than the other snack options out there. So next time you're hungry, grab strawberry lemonade fruit stars or sweet and salty nut medley and get smart about snacking. Right now, if you go to naturebox.com slash twit, you can get a trial of their favorite snacks delivered right to your door. What are you waiting for? Go to naturebox.com slash twit to start your trial today. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. This morning on Tech News Today, Mike Elgin reported that French taxi drivers blocked roads and caused havoc in Paris to protest Uber Pop. The traditional taxi drivers blocked entrances to Paris's major airports and train stations, attacked Uber drivers, and set cars on fire. Their complaint was that they pay more than a quarter of a million dollars for operating licenses, while Uber Pop drivers pay nothing. The photographs make it look a little bit like the French Revolution, although I am not exactly sure why they're taking it out on the drivers. According to TechCrunch, Amazon has unbundled its virtual assistant Alexa, providing an API for third-party developers to unlock the power of the device. Right now, the Echo is part personal assistant, part DJ, part sous chef, part homework assistant, and basically a very cool toy to impress your friends and neighbors. She has her limits, though. My biggest complaint is that unlike so many of my mobile devices, she's chained to an outlet on my bookshelf. But that could change very soon. Amazon's press release promises that with the new API, developers could create devices like interactive Wi-Fi alarm clocks, an Echo for your car's dashboard, or your TV remote, and more. The Verge says that Google's self-driving car prototypes have officially hit the road with safety drivers on board, of course. These are Google's own cars, not the Lexuses, with self-driving technology that have been on the streets for a while. Google showed off the cars last December, and then last month they announced the cars would be in the wild this summer, and that starts now. Safety drivers in the driverless cars are equipped with removable steering wheels, accelerators, and brake pedals. There is no reason to be afraid, people. Frankly, there is much more reason to be afraid if you're on the road with me behind the wheel. Plus, my car is not nearly as cute as those little Google cars. The company also launched a website at google.com slash self-driving car to leave comments or suggestions if you see the cars on the road. And finally, you might have heard that this week Hulu announced that you could now stream each of the 180 episodes of the sitcom Seinfeld and honor the announcement, they recreated the set of Seinfeld apartment down to the very last detail. The Superman action figures, the big book of Jewish humor, the compact PC. What? 
everyone knows that Seinfeld never used a PC. I, am I the only person who determined what season of Seinfeld the rerun was based on the model of Jerry's Mac? Christina Warren, eagle-eyed co-host of Tech News Today, spotted the error and tweet-shamed Hulu into fixing it. As of late yesterday, the set was complete with the Mac Performa 200. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can subscribe to the audio or the video version, or both. Write to us at TN2 at twit.tv, and you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thank you for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.